Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We thank you that we receive it written in our heart and mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. Thank you for all that you accomplish. We will be doers of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you on the subject of how Jesus has made all things new, everything new in the New Testament. And he has great things for every single one of us. Isaiah 42, verse 9, Behold, the former things are come to pass, all those things of the Old Testament written about Jesus. New things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. And he did tell us in the word of the things that Jesus was going to bring forth. And we see that he declared, as we mentioned this morning, in Jeremiah 31, verse 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And these days did come. Jesus came. He paid the price for sin. He's the one who was the firstborn from the dead. And he's the one who brought forth the means to be able to come back into reconciliation with God. And he's the one who brought forth the new covenant. We talked about the new covenant that he brought forth. We talked about how he brought forth all these things that were new. He brought forth a better covenant with better promises. We talked about also the fact that what man had to have was he had to have a new heart and a new spirit. We gave you the scripture out of Ezekiel chapter 36. But also, this is also declared in other places as well. Here in Ezekiel 18.31, Cast away from you all your transgressions, where you've been transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. That's what Jesus did. He went, he's the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world in order to make the way for you and I to get a new spirit and to get a new heart, which was absolutely essential. And in doing so, he made the way for you and I to come into relationship with God, which is through spiritual birth. John chapter 3, in verse 5, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. Two ways you can be born, two different types of birth. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Born of water is physical birth. Not talking about baptism with water. It's talking about born of water, physical birth. Because the child the baby is in the water, in, in, within in the water sack, and when that water breaks, the, the labor contractions are going to start, and the baby's going to be born. And we can tell that this is talking about this, because the next verse says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, physical birth. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That means there is physical birth, and there is spiritual birth. All of us have been born physically, we all must be born spiritually, where we get a brand new spirit. And that's what he's talking about. That's why he says in John 3, 7, Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The word again means from above. How does a spiritual birth occur? It comes from above. By God, through the Holy Spirit, when we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, then we get a brand new birth, spiritual birth where we get the spirit of Jesus Christ and we become a new creature. We talked about the new creation. We talked about the new relationship with God as our Heavenly Father. He's not a distant God. He's now our Heavenly Father. And you and I have become sons and heirs of God. And now we have are now servants of righteousness. We're not sinners any longer. And we talked about the new wine, which is the type of the Holy Spirit that comes into us as we get a new spirit which was what the, talked about the new wine put into the new bottles, the new bottles, the new spirit, the new wine's the Holy Spirit who comes to dwell in us. We also talked about now we have a means to pray a new way, new tongues. We can now speak with new tongues a spiritual prayer language that comes from the Holy Spirit, which is to be able to pray according to God, the Holy Spirit, praying through you a perfect prayer, a prayer that's speaking unto God and also is edifying you, building up and strengthening you at the same time it is powerful. Also, we see that there's a new priesthood now, not after the Old Testament, 
Now, after the New Testament priesthood, after the order of Melchizedek, which is a king and a priest, you and I have become kings to be able to rule and reign and to become priests, to be able to have free approach to God, to receive promises from Him, to minister to Him, to be in fellowship with Him. We also talked about the new law of Christ. This law is not a law that would bring the knowledge of sin, which was in the Old Testament. This is a law that brings liberty, the perfect law of liberty, the law of Christ. We also talked about the new commandment, the commandment to love. Every one of us are to love one another. See everybody as valuable, precious, and important. And he wants you to walk in love towards every single person. We also talked about the new doctrine, the new doctrine of Christ, not of the Old Testament. We don't follow the Old Testament ways any longer. We now follow the New Testament ways with the new doctrine of Christ. We talked about the new bread that we eat spiritually, which is the Word. Jesus is the bread from heaven that now we receive and the words through the Word of God. And now where's the Word written? And the Old Testament was written on the tables of stone. And they had the Ten Commandments. Well, now it's a difference. It's written in our heart and it's written in our mind in this day, the New Testament way. We also talked about all the Old Testament things pointed towards the spiritual realities of what Jesus would do. Now, we see all these things in the light of the spiritual realities. All these things were shadows of things to come. But now the spiritual realities have come into manifestation. We also talked about the fact that there's a new spiritual family. Jesus even talked about it when they said, well, your mother and your brethren want to see you. And he said, Who are my brother? who's my mother and who's my brother? And he pointed to the disciples and said, These are my mother and my brethren. We have a new spiritual family, which are now you and me. As we are born again, we're the spiritual family. We are all spiritual family together. Also a new approach to the Word of God, where the Word comes in you to produce fruit in your life and to bring promises and blessings in your life. This is why the devil will be after the Word, trying to get it out of your heart, because he knows if it stays in your heart, it's going to produce the promises of God. Because the Word is the power of God. It'll bring forth God's blessings upon you. So the devil will attack the Word. That's why we must understand how the enemy works and overcome his temptations and walk in line with the Word to see the fruit, more fruit, and much fruit come forth. We also talked about the fact that we are now the new temple, the temple of God. He doesn't dwell in a building any longer. He dwells in us. As he comes to dwell in you when you've got a brand new spirit on the inside of you, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you. And now, there's a new spiritual house that's to be built. You're to be building this through the Word of God by all the things you do. Everything that you're building in your life is important. And one of the scriptures we didn't look at, but it's important to realize, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, over here in verse... Not 10, it says, According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation, and another builds thereon. This is the word coming into you. Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. It's important that you take heed how you're building. What you're hearing and doing and walking after in your life, all your works, you're building something. You're building something. You want to be sure you're building the right thing. We need to take heed how we build thereon. Because he goes on and says in verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it. Because it shall be revealed by fire, the fire shall try every man's work of what it sort it is. At the end of our days, God is going to try everybody's works and see were they the works that were in line with God's ways in his word or were they works that were not. If any man's work abide, which meant, hey, it was a good work, that he's built thereupon, because you're building something in your life, he shall receive a reward. And that's what we want. We want the rewards that God will bring forth for us. But if any man's work shall be burned, that wasn't of the Lord, that was an evil thing. He shall suffer loss. God is a just God. He's a fair God. He doesn't wink at sin and just think that, you know, bad things aren't going to have any repercussions. That would be unjust. No, well, you'll suffer loss in some capacity. He himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. 
So we must realize now that a new approach to the Word is hearing and doing the Word and building our spiritual house and making sure we're doing the things that are important unto the Lord. Another thing, one of the things we didn't talk about is there is a new Sabbath now. There is not a physical Sabbath day any longer. This is important to realize. Most of the body of Christ out there thinks that there is a Sabbath day. There was a Sabbath day in the Old Testament. Sabbath means rest. Jesus is our rest. How, what's the Sabbath now about? Because all the physical points to the spiritual realities, meaning the physical rest, which was they were supposed to observe weekly, is all a rehearsal and pointing towards the real rest when it comes, who is Jesus. And so he is our rest, but there's more to it than that. There's a spiritual rest that you and I enter into. How is that? Hebrews 4.1, Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest. There's a new rest. Not some day that makes you holy or changes you. No. How do, what changes you and what brings forth the things of God? When you enter into his rest, and he says, any of you should seem to come short of it. God doesn't want us to come short of entering into his rest, which is good. How's it come? Through the word. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. God's word is bringing us to this place of what's necessary to enter into his rest. The word preached didn't profit them. It doesn't automatically profit you. It depends on what you do with it. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. When you hear the word, God expects you to take hold of it and do what it says. If you do what it says, then you're mixing your faith with it as you believe it and speak or believe and do what the word says, and then you'll see the results. You'll see the promises coming to pass. As he talks about the promise being left us of entering into his rest, how do you enter into the spiritual rest now? Through possessing the promises. As you possess God's promises in your life, you are going to enter into the spiritual rest of God. Paul addresses this in Colossians chapter 2 about the fact that there is no more any of this Sabbath keeping. Colossians 2.16. In fact, there's also not anything of keeping dietary laws or any of these kind of things. He says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, that's in food, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, we don't keep the feast of the Lord as far as observing a day now, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath. These are things that they kept in the Old Testament. And Sabbath is actually plural. Sabbaths. They put days in there referring to it, what it's talking about, but really days, is, that word is not in the Greek. Or the Sabbaths, the Sabbaths that were there. So, do we keep these things anymore? He says, don't anybody judge you about these things because you don't keep them anymore. What were all these? Which are a shadow of the things to come or a shadow of the coming things as Young's brings forth. They were pointing towards the coming things. They're not the things that brought the reality. This is why keeping things in the physical will not produce anything. It's what you do in the realm of the spirit that produces it. Their shadow of the coming things in the body of Christ that God brings all the things that he accomplishes for us. And we talked about the fact now that these spiritual realities we can enter into and entering into his rest is something that is available for all of us as we do his works. We see in verse 3, we which have believed do enter when it talks here about do enter, this is a present tense verb. The present tense in the Greek means ongoing action. We are, are, literally would be translated are continuing to enter into his rest. So we are believers. We are continuing to enter into his rest. How do we do that? By possessing the promises in our life. As he said, I've sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest if we do this, though the works are finished from the foundation of the world. He spake in a certain place the seventh day, saying, God did rest the seventh day from all his works. When he finished his works, he rested, didn't he? Same thing for us. If they shall enter into my rest, we would be in the same position of coming to the place of resting. He comes down here 
in verse 9, and he says, There remains therefore a rest, sabbatismos, a Sabbath rest of the people of God. And that is possessing the promises of God in our life. And then he comes down here and says, He that's entered into his rest, he ceased from his own works. When you've accomplished this, possessing the promises, then you will have ceased from your works because your works are how you're going to enter into it, doing the word. Let us labor. This means be diligent. It's a Greek word, spadazo, which really means to be <coughs> diligent. Young's corrects King James errors. Be diligent. Let us be diligent to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. That tells you what would stop you from entering into this spiritual rest? Unbelief. Well, what's unbelief? Why is that? Because that would hinder you from possessing the promises. So, does this have anything to do with keeping a day? No. Would unbelief hinder you from keeping a day? No, you could keep a day just by resting a particular day. It's not talking about a day any longer. There is now a spiritual Sabbath that we enter into. And fortunately, the Galatian church was one of those who went back into keeping all these Old Testament things, which is a mistake. And he says in Galatians 4, 9, Now after you've known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements whereby you desire again to be in bondage? Otherwise, they were going back into the Old Testament bondage. Oh, we're supposed to walk in the liberty. And he says, you're observing days and months and times and years. That's be like observing feasts, observing Sabbaths, observing particular days and events. He says, I'm afraid of you, lest I bestowed my la upon you labor in vain. I taught you the truth that we're not under that any longer and brought you into the spiritual realities that you enter into, and you're going back into observing these things in the natural? He says, my labor has been in vain. Otherwise, because it's not producing the right things. In other words, there is a new rest, new Sabbath rest, which is possessing the promises of God in our life, and we're to be diligent to do it. We talked about new spiritual sacrifices, new way of worship that we are now to enter into in our life as we worship in spirit and in truth. We talked about a new way to pray, and we want to just address that for a few minutes again. In John chapter 16, all the promises of God have been given to us. All the spiritual blessings are already ours. Because of that, do we need to, he's given them to us. Do we need to ask God to give us something that he already gave to us? No. That'd be a denial that he gave it to us. Since he already gave us all the promises, all the promises are yea and in him, amen, and we've already been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, what is prayer for? Prayer is a legal transaction in the Spirit to release the promises, the blessings that have already been given to us to come into manifestation in our life. So, are we going to ask God to do something? No. How can that be? Because of what the Word says. John 16, 23. In that day you shall ask me nothing. Ask or request nothing. And this is Jesus speaking. You're not going to even address things to Jesus. You don't pray to Jesus now. You pray to the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto whatsoever you shall, it says, ask the Father in my name, he'll give it you. Well, it looks like I'm supposed to be asking now, but the word is different. This is the first word, ask, arateo, number 2065, which we're going to show you the meaning specifically in a moment. This is the second word, ask. It's not the same word. It's this word, iteo, which means is number 154. It's a different word, yet it's translated the same. This is Strong's Concordance reproduced in a program called the Lightning Bible Program that I have from long ago. And this shows you the meaning of these words. Remember that one of 2065, a request is a favor. That's where it said we don't request or ask of a favor of Jesus anymore. But what do we do? Now we pray to the Father, and the word ask means a demand of something due. We make a spiritual demand of something due. It is a legal 
action according to law. And how do we do this? We do this as we bring in the word and pray the word, the promise of God that's already been given to us. Your word says such and such. Here's the promise that says such and such. So we bring that to him because we're coming to get a specific promise, a specific blessing that's already been given to us. That's how we pray now to make a demand of what's due us. We pray to the Father in the name of Jesus and declare your word says such and such. Then what else do we do? He said, hitherto, up to this time, have you made a demand of what's due you of nothing in my name? Make a demand of what's due you. All these words are Iteo. And you shall, Lombano, take hold of it. You are to take hold of those things. How do I take hold of it? How do I grab something in the spirit with your mouth? You receive by speaking words. I believe that I take hold of your mercy. I believe I take hold of your healing. I believe I take hold of your grace, whatever it might be. We come and take hold of these things. You speak them into being, in other words. That's how you do things in the realm of the Spirit. And your joy might be full, he says. Now, when you're doing these things, one of the things that we didn't talk about is you always approach with thanksgiving. Why would I approach God, the, Fa the Father, with thanksgiving? Because he already gave everything to you. If he gave something to me, I'm going to thank him for it as I'm coming to him. If he didn't give it to me, I'd be asking him to give it to me. But because all the promises are yea and him, amen, because we've already been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, and all these blessings have already been given to us, I'm not going to come and ask him. I'm going to come and thank him as I'm coming to take hold of it. That's why it says in Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. And what do we see Jesus doing continually? He was thanking the Father. We see Paul doing the same thing. I thank God, the Father, I thank God in every remembrance of you, night and day, praying for you. He's always praying these thanksgiving, beginning his prayer. It says, let your request, this is a form of the word Iteo, number 155, Itema, which means a demand of something due you. You make your demands that are due you made known unto God. So you pray with thanksgiving as you take hold of things. In fact, it's important that you learn to pray accurately in the New Testament. And if you do, you're going to be continually bringing thanksgiving out of your mouth. Look what it says here. If we go back one verse, it says, As you re therefore receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. How do I walk in him? By walking in the word, doing what the word says. Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding therein, as you're operating with your faith, with thanksgiving. If I'm abounding with thanksgiving, what's that mean? I'm just overflowing with thanksgiving continually coming out. What am I doing with my faith? Your faith receives the promises. So when I'm receiving the promises, what am I doing? I am speaking thanksgiving because thanksgiving shows forth faith. I thank you as I take hold of promises in my life. I thank you for your healing power flowing in my body. I thank you for giving me wisdom. I thank you for the angels having charge over me to keep me and protect me in all my ways. I thank you, you know, whatever the promise is that you're speaking into being. You're going to be doing this with thanksgiving. And one, one other thing that's important in the New Testament that's different, in the New, Old Testament, they had, of course, they couldn't make any demand of what was due them and they couldn't take hold of anything, but also they didn't have any confidence in prayer. Now we have confidence in prayer. 1 John 3, 21. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, and why would our heart not condemn us? Because we don't have, we don't have any sin in our life. We've confessed our sin. We're right before the Lord. Then we have confidence toward God. Confidence toward God is important. And it's not you manufacturing it in your mind. It's because of the fact that you're right with Him. When you are right with Him, you can have confidence to come into the very presence of God, to pray, to take hold of promises. So, having confidence toward God, whatsoever we, I tell, make a demand of what's due him, we, Lombano, receive, take hold of him, which is what you do when you're praying, 
because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. God wants you, of course, to be sure that you are right with him. How are you going to be right with God? Keeping his commandments, doing the things that are pleasing in his sight. So we're going to take hold of these promises to see them come into manifestation. And that is so important. So when you're praying, you're now praying to the Father in the name of Jesus. You pray the scripture promise of what belongs to you, what he's already brought to you, which is making a demand of what's due you. You do this with thanksgiving as you take hold of it. I thank you as I take hold of it with my mouth. I believe that I receive a particular promise and I speak it into being. When you do this, the other thing is you pray continuously because your faith is put into operation continuously. This is seen in the prayer of faith in Mark 11.24. Mark 11.24 is the prayer of faith for the New Testament where it says, Therefore I say unto what things soever you desire, the word desire again is this word number 154, iteo, which means a demand of what's due you, when you pray, believe that you lombano, the word which means to take hold of. Believe you take hold of it, and you shall have it. Every one of these verbs are all in the present tense in the Greek. The present tense in the Greek means continuous, ongoing action, meaning I continually do this. Pray, same thing. I do this continuously present tense. Believe is present tense. In fact, this is imperative, meaning it's a command. Receive is also present tense. What does that mean? You pray continuously. Why do I keep praying continuously? Because that keeps your faith applied continuously in seeing the promises coming to pass. In the realm of the Spirit, you keep your faith applied by continually speaking to see things come into manifestation. That's true also when you're using prayers of authority. We can see this in Mark 11, 23. You're speaking to a mountain, which would be a hindrance that the devil would bring against you. For I say unto you, whatsoever you shall say in the mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. They'll have whatsoever he saith. In speaking to a mountain or a problem or something that the devil has brought and we're commanding it to be removed. You hindrance, I command you to be removed in the name of Jesus. Do we do this one time? No. Do we speak commanding words to it? Yes, we command it to be removed. We command it to be cast out of the way, whatever it might be. When it says here, you believe what things you say, does it mean I just say it once? No, because the word say is present tense again, that I'm saying and continuing to say. Now, if I'm saying it now, am I supposed to believe that it shall at some point later on come to pass? No, that's not what it's saying. Because the word shall come to pass would be a future tense verb if it's correctly translated. We'll put the cursor over this and you'll see it is not a future tense verb. It is a present tense verb. It has been translated wrong in the King James. How would you translate this? You should believe that those things which he is saying and continuing to say are coming to pass continually. That's a present tense word. They are coming to pass. Which means what? When you're speaking commanding words, <coughs> It's happening now. You speak commanding words again. It's continually happening now because your faith is always now releasing it continually, continually, continually until you see the results. A good example would be casting the demon out in Acts chapter 16. In Acts chapter 16, this is a evil spirit, a spirit, spirit of divination was operating through a woman deceiving the people from the truth. Paul was going to get rid of this spirit out of this woman so she couldn't be used to deceive the people any longer. Paul, being grieved, turned to the spirit and he said, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. He spoke to that spirit and commanded to come out of her. 
Did he just speak one time? No. Why did he need to speak more than one time? Because it didn't come out right away. Why didn't it come out right away? Because the devils have power and can resist. So what's necessary? Continue to speak to release power and authority, power and authority, power and authority, power and authority. Keep releasing it until the spirits come out. Did he do this? Absolutely. The word command. When it's speaking about him commanding, it is present tense, which means he was continually commanding. I command you. Continually he's commanding him in the name of Jesus to come out. Now, did it come out right away? No. But did it come out? Sure did. It took a while. We can tell it took a little while because it says it came out the same hour. He might have been working for the, doing this for many minutes. You know, might have been close to up to 60 minutes. Said the same hour. So his continual commanding was releasing power and authority to drive that spirit out. This is why you must understand we always put the power of God and the authority of God or whatever we're speaking into operation with our mouth continually speaking it. We continue to command these things. It's the same thing in speaking promises into being. You keep speaking until you see it come into manifestation. And that's important. In the New Old, Old, Old Testament, they didn't know anything about this. This is a total revolutionary way of praying from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they'd ask, petition, hope maybe God heard them and wait to see if he's going to do something. In the New Testament, we already know all the promises are ours. We come boldly to the throne of grace. We pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. We bring the scripture promise. Your word says such and such. This is spiritual law. And we, with thanksgiving, I thank you, Father, as I believe I take hold of that and I keep speaking that and it brings it into manifestation in your life. Or when I'm using prayers of authority, I am speaking against the enemy, commanding those spirits to come out, or commanding that mountain to be removed, knowing that every time I speak, it's happening, it's happening, it's happening, it's happening. How long do I have to do it? Until it's removed, until it comes out. You just keep doing it. Will it work? Absolutely. The mountains will be removed, the hindrances will be removed, the demons will come out, the changes will come, and we'll see these things happen. This is so important to understand. This is the new way to pray in the realm of the Spirit. And you can always see results if you will just do what he says. Continually cast out, continually command the mount to be removed, continually pray and speak these things into being. This is why the Bible tells us, pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. It means you don't stop until you've seen the results. You continually pray. And if we keep on praying, we will see the results. Another thing that we must realize is that we're talking about the tremendous changes and the new things that have come forth. Who are now the true people of God? And what were the people of God called? They were called Jews. Romans chapter 2, verse 28. This is quite a statement. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, meaning physically born. Neither is that circumcision, which was physical, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. That means who are now the people of God? Inwardly. They got a new spirit. They got a new heart in their new heart. Circumcision is out of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter. It's praise not of men, but of God. There is a new people of God. It is those who are born again that now are Jews inwardly because of the change that has occurred. And furthermore, we see scriptures that show this clearly, that there isn't, any, there isn't one Jew and then there's a Greek or a Gentile over here, as some people always talk about. No, they make a mistake. They try to separate it out. That's the mistake. Romans 10, 12. There's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. There isn't any difference from God's standpoint any longer. The same Lord is over all, is rich unto all that call upon him, Romans 10, 12. Furthermore, from God's perspective, because he looks at things in the realm of the Spirit, when you get born again, look what it says in Galatians 
There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. Now you are physically, but spiritually, there isn't one. We all have the Spirit of Christ. There isn't one. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. So, there's a big change. It's all now, God has made the change on the inside and he views us all that way. Also, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances. The law of commandments of the Old Testament brought the knowledge of sin, showing them they weren't right with God, they needed a savior, they had to do something about their sin. All that they could do in the Old Testament was the high priest once a year would put the blood on the mercy seat. It would cover over for the sin for that year. Wouldn't get rid of it. It's not until Jesus came. Jesus took the sin away, abolished in his flesh this enmity because he bore away all the sin. For to make in himself of two, Jew and Gentile, one new man. There's only one. There aren't two any longer. There's one new man. It's already been accomplished. God wants us to understand that. So all this that tries to put a difference between it from God's perspective, all he is interested in is one thing. Get born again, get a new spirit, a new heart, become a Jew inwardly, and now be in relationship with him. He's going to look at you as one after the spirit. We also see in Ephesians chapter 4, Verse 22, put off concerning the former conversation. Former means manner of life, conduct, and behavior. Our manner of life and our conduct and behavior before we're born again is walking in sin, according to the flesh and the ways of the world, things that aren't right with God. It's corrupt according to deceitful lusts. So what are we going to do? We're going to be renewed in the spirit through the word of God, of our mind, the Word of God is going to bring revelation of the Word of God, the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man. We're now going to put on this new man, brand new man on the inside of you, which is how? Through the Word. The Word is going to do a revolutionary work in you because it's going to renew your mind. You're not going to think differently. You're not going to think carnally. You're not going to think worldly. You're not going to think fleshly anymore. You're not going to think based on the way you feel anymore. Now you're going to think according to God's Word. You're going to think spiritually, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. We are to put on this new man. And that is so important. That's through the Word of God in you. As you put on the new man, this is because you're going to get the Word in you. And how do I do that? I'm going to seek the things above, not the things on the earth. Colossians 3, verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ, what does that mean? I'm not talking about physically, spiritually. Have you been risen from spiritual death unto spiritual life? Yes. When? When you got born again. You've come in now. You've been risen with Christ. So you're born again, now you have a spirit that's right with God, you're in relationship with Him, you've been born from above. Seek those things that are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. We're to seek all the things above. Where, what, what's all these things above? It's all what's in the New Testament. Everything that's written in the New Testament, because that's what's above. So well, how do you know that? We'll come back here in a moment. First, that's First Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. That means we've been <coughs> born again. To what? A lively or living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's the one who accomplishes for us from the dead. And what did we come to? We now have come to an inheritance because now we're sons, heirs, joint heirs with Christ, we have an inheritance that belongs to us. What's the inheritance? All the blessings of the New Testament, all the promises that belong to us. Incorruptible, undefiled, fades not away, and where is it? Reserved 
in heaven for you. Since it's reserved in heaven for you, then what am I supposed to do? I want to be seeking what's in heaven. That's why it says, seek the things that are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection or to get understanding on things above. I want to learn heaven's ways. I want to learn New Testament ways. I want to learn the law of Christ. I want to learn how I conquer the enemy in my life, how I overcome everything that would come against me. The New Testament shows us it all. Not the things on the earth. They're not going to help you overcome the devil. You've got to have spiritual revelation and spiritual understanding, which comes from the Word. And how do I seek these things above if I'm here on earth? Through the Word of God. The Word of God came from above, and now we have a copy of it that we can look at the Word, and the God will take this that's come from above, that we can receive it written in our heart and mind. He'll open our eyes. He'll bring revelation of God's ways, and we can walk in line with it as we're seeking the things above that are shown us in the Bible. The Bible reveals all the things above. So this is why we study the Word of God. And we get our mind set after the things above. We talked about that, about how we need to have our mind, a new focus of mind. Does, you want to have your focus on the things of the flesh? No. They that are after the flesh are minding the things of the flesh, wherever your focus is. They that are after the Spirit, they're going to be minding the things of the Spirit. To be carnally minded, that's just fleshly minded, it's death. It's not going to cause you to get promises and blessings and overcome the devil and get healed and get delivered and see God bless you and prosper you and do great things in your life. No. But to be spiritually minded, understanding all the spiritual ways of God, which are going to show you how to walk in victory, is life and peace. That's what God wants. This is why we've got to get our mind renewed. So you think like God thinks, not like man thinks. Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world, or really this means to this age. Why? What's wrong with it? Satan's the god of this age, and he has worked to bring people to think on things and seek after things that are not of the Lord whatsoever. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God wants your mind to get renewed so it's going to be changed. The word transform is a word metamorpho in the Greek. If you remember from science class, metamorphosis is the process whereby the caterpillar is changed into a butterfly. That's a change in species. That's what's going to happen to you and me through the word. We're going to be changed from a carnally minded to a spiritually minded person. From an earthly minded to a heavenly minded person. From one who's just one run, running around in the natural realm to one who has a spiritual mind and understands the things of the spirit. That is what you want. Because that is what runs everything. Life is spiritual. The spiritual realm controls everything that's going on in the natural realm. God spoke words and brought things into being from the Spirit, brought things into manifestation in the natural. That's why we want to get a spiritual mind. We also talked about, we'll just point this out briefly, but we talked about it. We now have a new spirit of faith. Faith is not a feeling. Many people say, well, I don't feel like I have faith. Well, that's probably so, because it's not a feeling. Faith is a spirit thing, you, spiritual thing. You need to know that you have a spirit of faith because the Word says you have one. What does that mean if I don't feel something that it has nothing to do with it? That's right. Feelings have nothing to do with it at all. Your faith operates is a spirit of faith. How do I operate it? According to knowledge. Just doing what the Word says. It's not, well, well I got to, oh, I feel like I got faith now. No, it's not a feeling thing. It's a spiritual thing. You believe God's word, you speak, your faith's in operation. Doesn't matter what you feel like. Who cares about feelings? If you're looking for feelings, you're in the flesh. You're trying to get the flesh to tell you whether or not you're walking right with God. 
It doesn't have anything to tell you at all because the voice of the flesh is your feelings. Why would you look for feelings? Don't pay attention to feelings. Operate in the Spirit according to the Word of God and you will see God bring forth great things in your life. Another thing that we see is now there is a new way for you and I to walk because Galatians chapter 5 Verse 16 says, Walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. They're contrary or opposite or adverse, adversaries to one another. That means, what happened to you when you got born again? You got a new spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And that's, by the way, when the, the S here capitalized, shouldn't have been capitalized. There's no capital letters in the Greek. It was capitalized by the translators thinking they're talking about the Holy Spirit, but it's not. It's talking about your spirit. Did you get a new spirit? Yes. What spirit is that? The spirit of Jesus Christ. Did you get new flesh? No, I got the same body. The devil had control of everything. But now you get a new spirit, you didn't have control of that anymore. So is your spirit going to be in line with your body? No. Sin still dwells in the flesh because you haven't gotten change in the flesh yet. you still got the same body. So they're going to be against each other. Your spirit is against your flesh, and your flesh is against your spirit. They don't want, they're not going to be mixed at all, go in the right direction. They're contrary one to another. So now, we don't have to yield to the flesh any longer and be run by the flesh, which everybody out in the world is run by the flesh, basically. Now we can be run by the Spirit, which is according to God, which has no sin in it. We can conquer and overcome all sin in our life, and we can operate in the Spirit at all <coughs> times, and that is so important. What do we do? There's a new way to approach the flesh as well. What do we do with the flesh? Well, we're going to crucify this thing. We're going to put off the deeds of the body. Luke 9, 23, he says to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily. What's the cross? The cross is where something is put to death. So what are we going to put to death? The deeds of the body or desires of the body daily. We're not going to let it run us whatsoever. We refuse to let it have control of us any longer. In Romans chapter 8, it says here in verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we're debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. You could live after the flesh by your feelings, because that's the voice of the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you'll die, because you're run by the, fle by the flesh. If you through the Spirit do mortify, which means put to death the deeds of the body, I'm not letting the body run me. You shall live. So now the new approach to the flesh is, I don't go by my feelings. I put down all the feelings of doing things that are contrary to God's word. I'm not going to yield to them. I feel like I want to get angry or retaliate against someone. No. I'm not going to do that. God's word says I'm supposed to be long-suffering and walk in love and not to be doing those things. Whatever feelings come to you from the flesh, you're not going to yield to them. You're going to put them to death and you're going to walk on what the, what the word says in every situation. That's how you would walk in the spirit. The way you now can function in the spirit is by the word, which is spirit. God's word is spirit and it's life. It is spiritual law. So when you think, what does the Word say in every situation, then you're contacting that which is of the Spirit. If you don't and you respond out of the way you feel, you're being run by the flesh. And you're not mortifying the deeds of the body. You do not want to let your body run you any longer. Instead, we're now we're going to walk in the Spirit. That's a new way. They couldn't do that in the Old Testament. They had, they had no way. They were just run by their flesh continually. God wants us now to walk by the Spirit. As we walk by the Spirit, then we're going to walk in the ways according to the Word of God. Now, another thing that's important, 
is the understanding there's a new definition of sin. Sin in the Old Testament was committing wrong acts. I did a wrong deed. I did a wrong thing. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. Here's an example. You've heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's an act of doing something wrong. But I say to you, whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. That means now sin is out of a motivation of your heart. In fact, you may never commit the act, but you could be doing this continually if you have this mo motivation of lusting out of your heart. It's a higher law. We, can, we must deal with things. It's, not, it's going to be your motivation from within. See? Not just the acts that you commit. So it's a higher law now. This is why we need to walk according to God's ways. And remember, sin has no dominion over us. The key will be putting the word first place and making sure we got our heart right. How are you going to have your heart right? By getting the word in your heart and doing what the word says. And you've got to guard your heart so the devil doesn't come in and take the word out of your heart and bring evil things into your heart. Now another thing that's important, not only to the new approach to the flesh, but also you and I have come into the kingdom. In the Old Testament, they could rule and reign in the natural, as kings did. Well, and all, no, not all the people were kings, only people that had special anointing from God. It's a new day today. In fact, all of us are kings. Revelation 1.6 says Jesus now has made us kings and priests. What do kings do? They rule. What am I, are we talking about ruling over the world, over the natural? No. Because remember, we're dealing with things in the realm of the spirit. That's the real battle. Who are we going to rule over? The devil who has been running this world. We're going to rule over the devil who is a spirit and all the evil spirits and all their works. And that's what drives people as well to do evil things as well. We have dominion. So there's been a change. And what have we all become kings? What, what kingdom did we come into? It's now the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.13, who hath delivered us from the authority of darkness, power means authority here, we were under Satan's dominion before, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. You and I have come into the position of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We can rule and reign over every enemy in our life. You are a king. You are to rule and reign over the devil who would come against you in any capacity. You've got to know you're a king. And you've got to act like a king. And walk like a king. And use the authority that God has given to you to conquer the enemy. It takes authority to conquer him. And God has given you authority. That's why the Bible talks about, in Luke chapter 10... He's given you now, in verse 19, Behold, I give unto you authority. This is the word exousia, meaning authority, to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. God's given you authority over all the power of the enemy. You're going to release authority through the name of Jesus, and you're going to speak and release this authority against the enemy as you speak forth. In the name, every time you speak in the name of Jesus. You command the demons to come out in the name of Jesus because the name of Jesus is like the power of attorney releasing the authority of Jesus Christ and you're simply speaking and he's operating through you to do the mighty works. That's why you always do everything in the name of Jesus. You're releasing the authority of Jesus Christ here on earth through you who has the same spirit of Christ. And so when you speak in his name, it's his authority operating through you, and you release it. And that's what you're to do. You're to use your authority and conquer the enemy. Also, in the New Testament, of course, they now understood who the real enemy is now, we do. The Old Testament, they were all people, remember? Well, who's the real enemy? The devil's the real enemy. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be, sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, Satan is the adversary 
You cannot see him. He's a spirit. The word of God reveals what he does. As a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And he will work at you and try to get you to sin, which gives place to the devil. This is why, as we learn God's ways and we operate in the spirit and we take dominion over all these spirits and cast them out and destroy all their works, we will walk in victory. Not only do we understand who the enemy is now, we realize that we are to fight against these spiritually. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 12, are people our problem? No. Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against people, but against principalities, against authorities, literally this means, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in high heavenly places. Who is this talking about? Evil spirits that are serving Satan, that are in all these different areas, they're very organized in their hierarchy of rule and reign. We have dominion. We have authority. We now can bind them to tie them up. We can loosen and untie their hold. We can cast them down and throw them down and destroy their works. You have authority. This is a new day. They couldn't do anything like that in the Old Testament. We can now. Jeremiah 1.10, See, I have this day set thee over the nations, over the kingdoms, to root out, to pull down, to destroy, and to throw down. You can throw down all these spirits, as well as to build and plant the things of God as you speak things into being. It's all spiritual activity. And you and I can conquer all enemies. Which means we are going to be involved in warfare. But what kind of warfare? It is a spiritual warfare. 1 Timothy 1.18, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies that went before on thee, that thou mightest by them war a good warfare. You're going to war a good warfare. You're going to fight against the enemy. You are in a spiritual warfare. In fact, God has called you to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. 2 Timothy 2.3, you're to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Not in the natural, fighting against people. That's what they did in the Old Testament. It's changed. Now we're fighting against the real enemy, which are the evil spirits. No man that warreth entangles himself with the affairs of this life. If you're all cooked in with the affairs of this life, how are you going to operate in the spirit and be a soldier as God wants you to be? You won't. That he may please him, hath chosen to be a soldier. You have been chosen to be a so spiritual soldier in the army of the Lord, and he wants you to use, to, to engage in this spiritual fight in the army of the Lord. We also now have spiritual weapons. In the Old Testament, they were using a physical sword, weren't they? Well, in the New Testament, we have different weapons. What of our weapons? Our weapons are spiritual weapons as we put on the whole armor of God. This armor is spiritual armor. Be strong in the Lord, the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. For what? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So it's going to be dealing with the devil. The spiritual armor of God is the word in you. In your heart, in your mind, in your mouth, directing your steps. You are going to speak forth the word and you're going to conquer every work of the devil. You can stop all the works of the devil. That's what Jesus did. And they, nobody could do anything to him until he gave himself into the hands of the enemy to go to the cross. Because the devil is working through people. This is why we tell you to bind the spirits that are operating in people or through them to stop the works. We've seen this happen all the time. That's why we tell people, you got a lot of problems going on in your workplace? Bind the demons that are operating over the workplace. Bind the demons that are in the people that are doing the things they're doing. And people have done that, and they say, wow, big change. You kind of shut down all this evil stuff that was going on. Because you used your authority to stop the devils operating through the people. And God's power came into operation. That's what Jesus did. 
They were going to throw him off the brow of the hill at Nazareth. He walks right through the midst of them. What happened? He bound, obviously, the demons and stopped their works. Life is spiritual. We must realize now, we've come into the place in the kingdom of Jesus Christ with authority and power and spiritual weapons and the means to release spiritual power against all the evil spirits that are operating, whether they're in the heavenlies, whether they're in people, whether they're whatever they're doing. We can bind them, we can lose their hold, we can even cast them out. Of course, you don't cast them out of people unless they're right with God. Unless you're doing what, they did, what he did in Acts 16 where he was casting that spirit of divination out, not to get the person free, but to stop the work of the devil through her. He cast that spirit of divination to stop that spirit operating through her that was deceiving the people away from the truth. You can do that. Otherwise, you're not going to cast the demons out of people to try to get them, because they, they aren't going to get free until they get right with the Lord, of course. So we now have spiritual weapons. And what are we to do? We are to use these weapons against the enemies. You're in a spiritual war. 2 Timothy 10, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 10, 3. For though we walk in the flesh in a physical body, we don't war after the flesh with a physical means. We do things in the spirit now. He goes on and says, for the weapons of our warfare, spiritual warfare, they're not carnal, they're not fleshly, they're not of the natural, but they're powerful through God. Powerful is what this literally means, to the pulling down of strongholds. You can release powerful weapons to stop the works of the enemy and to destroy the works of the devil. You can cast out demons. Mark chapter 16. Mark, that is. Could they cast out the demons in the, New Test in the Old Testament? They didn't have authority. Their sins weren't washed away. They weren't in a position where they could do something. It was actually under the Old Testament, but they couldn't do it themselves because they weren't in a position of authority until Jesus came on the scene. Mark 16, 17, These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. What happens when you speak in the name? You release the power of attorney, the authority that's been delegated to you. They shall cast out the devils. How do I do that? With words. You command the demons to come out of a person in the name of Jesus. You can release the authority and destroy the works of the enemy. In fact, you can destroy all of Satan's works in your life that have come in because also it's important to understand evil spirits have come into us. How did they get there? Through the open door of sin. Have we all sinned? Yes. We all have evil spirits that have come into us. Does that mean I'm a terrible, evil person? No. It's understanding how the enemy works. Evil spirits have come in and we're to cast them out. This is the man who got healed. Well, you thought, well, I thought he'd just pray for healing for him. He was blind, they had a devil blind and dumb. He caused a physical problem. Well, how did the guy get free from his blindness and dumbness? The demon was cast out. When the demon was cast out, and they were all amazed that he did this. He was casting out the demons. Otherwise, the spirits are the root of the problems. This is why we've cast out spirits of cancer. We've seen 22 people that I've ministered to directly healed of cancer, and seen we've got testimonies that continually come in from people that are using the cast out cancer, or they do it themselves, and they get free of the cancer. We've had another one come in the last few months of another person who got healed of cancer by casting out the spirits and driving them out till they were gone. Because that's the root of the problem. If I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. We're in the kingdom. How do we bring the rule and reign of God? We can't bring the authority against the evil spirits and cast them out and see God's rule and reign come forth. Furthermore, see, they couldn't do anything about it. It's a new day. The New Testament is we can cast out the spirits. We can also destroy the demonic house that's in us. And all these spirits have come in from inheritance, our own sins, our victimization in life. 
Matthew 12, 29, how can one enter into a strong man's house? That would be Satan's house. He's the strong man. And spoil his goods, which is to get rid of them all. Except he first bind the strong man. You bind Satan and all those evil spirits. And then he spoils his house. How do you spoil his house? You cast out all the spirits and get rid of them. Well, the house, is that talking about demons? Yeah, it is. Because the demons think of you as their house. We know that from Matthew 12, 43. When unclean spirit, that's an evil spirit, is gone out of a man, he walks through or passes through dry places, seeking rest, finding none. He says, I'll return to my house. And that was the person. Demons can see you to their house. But once you've come to Jesus Christ and you're born again and you've got a new spirit, all the demons are trespassers. They have no right in you. And they're not to be operating in you. They're not to be causing physical problems. They're not to be causing mental problems. They're not to be causing behavioral problems. This is the enemy working. God wants them cast out to get you set free. It causes anxiety problems, all kinds of things. You cast them out and you get free. And you can be delivered from all these things. That's what Jesus did. Remember the man who had the tremendous network of spirits in him? The legion of spirits, when the demons were gone, this guy possessed with the devil a legion, he was in his right mind. The demons were causing his problem. Well, the world out there just says it's all a bunch of chemical imbalances. Well, the demons cause chemical imbalances. But what's the real root? The demons that are causing it. That's why all they can do is medicate you and down you out to try to shut down the effects of the demons and you're stuck in it forever. Taking medication to shut down the effect while you're casting out is not a problem. But it's not going to get you free of it, that's for sure. What's going to get you free is when those spirits are gone, you won't have those problems any longer. It's a new day, a new spoiling of the demonic house of the tennis. We can cast out everything. We've seen people be set free from so many things. Been ministering deliverance for 30 some years. It's 1984. So it's what, 34 years now, helping people get set free from all kinds of bondages. There's also a new thrust of ministry. In the Old Testament, they stayed away from all the nations. You know, we don't want to have anything to do with you. Not today. Now what are we to do? We're to go forth and preach the gospel to everybody to get born again. Matthew 9, 37, he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray you, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he sends forth labors into his harvest. And the harvest field is the world. Everybody needs to receive Jesus and be born again and then begin to follow his ways and learn how to conquer the enemies and get set free and take hold of promises and see God do a revelation, revolutionary work in their life to bring forth his blessings. Because God wants to bless everybody. He already accomplished it. He gave the blessings to us already, but he wants it manifest in us. He wants us to have peace. He wants us to have prosperity. He wants us to have health. He wants us to have blessings he wants the things that we do in life to be blessed, good things to work for us. He doesn't want evil things. All the evil things that have happened in our life has been a work of the devil hindering us. We have now authority. We can do something about it. It's a new day. We can destroy every work of the enemy. It is a fight. It is an ongoing process. But as we do it, we will see victory. The enemies don't want to leave, but we have dominion. See, everything's new. They couldn't do anything in the Old Testament. They were bound. And it's amazing. What's the thing that the devil has fought against in the body of Christ the most of anything? Deliverance. Casting out the spirits. Ninety plus percent of all the Christians and the churches out there, you go and knock on the door of every single one of them and say, hey, do you guys cast out demons all the time and drive the demons out of everybody's life? No, we don't believe in that. We don't think anybody has any. They've been deceived. Everybody has. Everybody needs deliverance. It's a good thing. Jesus got the guy free of blindness, dumbness, deafness. The guy free from his mind, totally out of his mind, his right mind. That's good things. 
Deliverance is good. God wants us to conquer the enemy and to be set free. Jesus has accomplished great things for us. Everything he does is new. In fact, when Jesus comes back, there's everything that's going to be, there's going to be more new things. Look what it says in Revelation. There's going to be new things. Some of the things that we're going to get, we're going to get a new name. We're either the hidden man and give a white stone, and we're going to get a new name. There'll be a new name written for everybody. There's going to be a new Jerusalem that is going to come. <laughs> he talks about the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven. Because there's going to be a new heavens, and there's going to be a new earth. Everything's going to be new. This, this earth will not be here forever. After the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, it's going to be eliminated. And there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. Everything is going to be new. And the good news is, of course, if we're right with the Lord. We're going to be with him forever. Revelation 21.5, He that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. He makes everything new. That's why we want to know everything that Jesus has done for us. We want to learn all of his ways. We want to learn all of his promises. We want to understand all the ways of the Spirit. We want to be able to conquer all the works of the enemy. And we want to see everything that he has done new come into manifestation in our life. All the ways of the Lord, they're all new. And he's going to do great things. So the great news is the fact that Jesus has made all things new in the New Testament. Praise God. Don't ever go back to the Old Testament or the old ways. It's amazing that Christians today are going back to the Old Testament ways or continuing in the Old Testament ways. Why would you go back to the old when you have the new, which is far exceeding above, above it, which contains so many things that the new, the old did not, and the old brought, was in, brought them back into bondage. <laughs> they never could overcome anything. Are we under the Ten Commandments? No. We're not. That's Old Testament. And yet Christians will fight over this all over the world. I want my Ten Commandments up. It didn't bother me if you want. It doesn't matter. I all, you know, it's irrelevant because we're not under it. We're going to walk in line with the New Testament with the Word of God. That's what we walk after, the higher law, the way of the Lord. So as you and I learn the ways of the Lord and we walk in line with the New Testament, you're going to see God do great things. All things are possible to him that believeth. He will cause you to become completely victorious in all things. He will give you victory. He's the healer. He's the deliverer. He's the restorer of all things. He'll give, bring all the promises. He wants you blessed. He wants you to have a good life. He wants you blessed in everything that you do. In fact, the blessings will come on you and overtake you. At the same time, you've got an adversary, the devil. You've got to conquer him. That's why it's so important to know about deliverance and spiritual warfare and our spiritual weapons and operating in the kingdom to conquer them. When you do that, you're going to see the victory because the devil will try to stop the things of God from coming forth. Look what the devil's done in the world. It's a disaster. It's getting worse. Sickness everywhere. Poverty everywhere. Hatred, anger, retaliation, hurting people, be, you know, bullying people, all this kind of stuff that's going on. This is all the devil running people. All this immorality. God wants us to make sure we're walking in the ways of the Lord. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you that Jesus Christ has made all things new in the New Testament. I thank you that when I receive Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior and are born again, I get a new spirit. I am now in Jesus Christ. I now can walk according to the New Testament. He's made everything new. I am going to operate in the new and see all the blessings come forth in my life. I thank you 
that I will always operate in the Spirit, according to the Word of God, in the New Testament, from this day forward. And I will see God's great blessings come forth in my life. Thank you, Jesus, for making all things new and bringing me to the place of being able to possess every promise, every blessing. Thank you. I will be a hearer and a doer of your word, and I will see you do it in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And no, God's no respecter of persons. What he's done for one, he'll do for all. He'll do it for every one of us. But we do have to learn his ways, and we've got to walk in his ways. You can't walk in your own ways, or you're going to be destroyed by the devil. You walk in God's ways, you're going to get victory. That's what Jesus, Jesus didn't do a thing himself. He did everything the Father told him to do. You've got to come to the same place. Don't do anything in yourself. Do everything that the Word says. God will do great things in your life. Father, we thank you for all that you brought forth. Thank you that we will walk according to the new in the New Testament, and we will see the great blessings come forth in all areas of our life. Thank you. We're hearers and doers of this word, and we praise you for the great results and all the things that you will accomplish in every one of our lives because we are hearers and doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. We've got one more message to do on the subject of the covenant.